Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second uh, webinar in the QM Best Practice Workshop of this year. This is the final webinar in the QM Best Practice Workshop. Uh, however, it's not the end of the workshop, but I'll say a bit more about that at the end. So to introduce today's speaker, today we have uh, Professor Carmen Rovira, who is based at the University of Barcelona in the Department of Inorganic and Organic Chemistry. She's also part of the Catalan Institute for Research and Advanced Studies. Um, her group looks at uh, enzymatic reactions, for example, particular recently heme and carbohydrate active enzymes, as well as ligand protein interactions, um, in both atomistic and electronic detail, using a variety of computational approaches, classical and ab initio MD, for example, Carbonello, and very relevant for today, QMMM. Um, and all to, all to also contribute to the design of more efficient enzymes and new drugs. Uh, so Karma has been a recipient in the past of a Marguerite Fellowship, um, which she performed at MPI Stuttgart uh, together with uh, Michele Parinello. She held a Ramon de Cajal Fellowship as well, uh, received in 2019 a, um, a, a Emil Fischer Award from the European Carbohydrate Organization. Uh, and just last year was awarded a European Research Council Synergy Grant um, to work with colleagues at the University of Leiden and New York and New York um, on uh, glycobiology. So with that, I will hand over to Carmen. So thank you, Arno, and thank you also the organizers for inviting me to uh, deliver this talk and this very interesting series of webinars on QMMM simulations. So. I'm going to talk about the modeling of catalytic mechanisms in carbohydrate active enzymes, uh, something that we do with QMMM molecular dynamics methods. And uh, so this is about carbohydrates. And I'm going to focus specifically on one family of enzymes that the ones that are the ones that that catalyze the cleavage of the glycosidic bond in, carbohyd in carbohydrates, the so-called glycoside hydrolysis. The glycosidic bond is the carbon oxygen bond that joins two sugar units in a carbohydrate. So I'm going to focus on the enzymes that catalyze the cleavage of this bond, because there are many types of carbohydrate dietary enzymes, and there's no time to uh, cover all of them, of course, in one time. So this is about carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are uh, very important for, for, for our life. They account for 50% of our daily calorie intake. So they are our biological food and also the primary form of storage and energy consumption in higher organisms. It was early thought that carbohydrates uh, play um, mainly a role of uh, energy storage, like uh, glycogen in our body, in our liver, and in our muscles. This is our glucose reservoir, and also the, the um, starch in the many of you know, the food that, that we take. This is for energy storage. And also, they, it was thought also that, that these were the major roles, energy storage and also structural support, like cellulose in, in plant cell walls. However, it is known nowadays that carbohydrates play many other roles in nature. In particular, there are many carbohydrates that are uh, on the surface of all our cells. They are attached either to the lipids of the membrane or, or the covalently attached to them, or also to, they are attached to proteins of the membrane. And also many of our proteins, most of all of our proteins are glycosylated. Even the SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, contains many carbohydrates that are surrounding and covering uh, the spike protein. They form a dense coat of, of, um, of sugars here, and this, the dynamics of these carbohydrates were recently uncovered in the very nice work by Romy Amaro and Elisa Fada very, very recently. So these carbohydrates that are on the surface of all our, our cells, they play a major role in cell-cell interaction processes. Um, they are, like, they are like antennas that the cells use to communicate each other, to talk it, it one each other. And of course, by doing this, they, tos, they also protect us from invaders like viruses or bacteria. They protect us from them binding and infecting our cells. Um, the shape on the the shape and the three-dimensional structure, let's say, of these uh, carbohydrate antennas, the so-called glycoforms, depends on the uh, amount and composition of the sugar units that they contain. There are several essential, essential, essential sugars. 
Oh, sorry, I lost my presentation here. <laughs> and this is uh, like glucose, manose, galactose, etc. several essential sugars. And this is quite important. For instance, um, our blood group, whether we are A, B, A, B, or O, it mainly depends on the, it depends fully on the type of distribution of our carbohydrates on the surface of our red blood cells. It, it quite a lot depends on whether there is or not an N-acetyl galactosamine um, sugar, which is a derivative of galactose with an N-acetyl group here, and in which is the distribution of this sugar around. So when this type of uh, carbohydrate uh, antennas, these glycoforms on the surface of our cells are not working properly, they are not assembled properly uh, because uh, maybe one sugar unit is missing or there is too much of it, there are many problems that can occur, many diseases like inflammation, autoimmune diseases, allergies, etc., infection. And the responsible for it many times is one of the many enzymes that are in charge, that are responsible for catalyzing the cleavage or the formation of the many glycosidic bonds in each of these uh, carbohydrate uh, antennas in the glycophores. And this has uh, brought a lot of attention to carbohydrate adding enzymes that uh, several of them uh, are important therapeutic targets to treat a large number of diseases. And they have also other applications like diagnostic markers and also in, in the industry, in the biofuel, food, paper industry, etc. Um, there are several classes of carbohydrate adding enzymes, but two of the major classes are um, glycoside hydrolases and glycoside transferases. Glycoside trans hydrolases break down carbohydrates into pieces because what they do is they catalyze the cleavage of the glycosidic bond. While glycoside transferases do the opposite, they catalyze the formation of the glycosidic bond, so they form new carbohydrates. In our group, we are um, interested in, in, uh, in discovering uh, new aspects of these enzymes, how, of how they work, in particular, how the substance binds to the enzyme and how catalysis takes place. And by doing computer simulation, we have access to properties that sometimes escape experimental probes, like uh, transition states, short-lived intermediates, conformational itineraries, uh, electronic states, etc. And all these can contribute to uh, understand the factors that control catalysis and can contribute to, to engineer these uh, enzymes for, uh, for other purposes. And, and that talk, I'm going to focus on, on catalysis on glycosidases, so in the enzymes that catalyze the cleavage of the glycosidic bond. Uh, glycosidases uh, used to main catalytic uh, mechani mechanisms, this is in all textbooks, mm, depending whether they retain or they invert the configuration of the anomeric carbon. That's anomeric carbon, carbon number one, the important one, because it's the one that forms the glycosidic bond. In a retaining glycosidase, the glycosidic bond is beta, so um, equatorial, and now it, is, it, is, uh, it, it, it remains equatorial from beta to beta. This is a retention of configuration. And, in, and in, if it's an inverting enzyme, then it goes from uh, equatorial to, to axial or, or the other way around, no? but it inverts the configuration. Uh, there are two, in dependently of the mechanism, there are two uh, protein residues that do the main work. They are uh, based on carboxylic acid ch side chain. This is, uh, although there are some exceptions, but this is the most of the glycosidases used to uh, residues based on carboxylic acid side chain. The one is uh, initially protonated, the so called acid based residue, and the role is to protonate the living group while the, to protonate the living group while the glycosidic bond is cleaved. And the other is unprotonated, nucleophile or general base. In the, in the case of retaining glycosidases, the nucleophile attacks the anomeric carbon while the glycosidic bond is cleaved. And in the case of uh, inverting glycosidases, it's a bit more farther, farther away because there is a water molecule in between that is the one that attacks the anomeric carbon. And this water is protonated by the general base. Um, this is the typical mechanism, the typical picture that you see in textbooks with the reactive sugar, the one that is uh, before the cleavage uh, point, in a chair conformation, a relaxed chair, 4C1. Carbon number four is above the plane, carbon number one is below the plane. However, this is, this is not uh, the case anymore. It is known nowadays that when the, when the carbohydrate, when the substrate binds to the enzyme, it binds in a distorted conformation. In particular, the reactive sugar, not the other ones, not the other ones, just this sugar here, um, 
distorts to a bold or skew bold conformation. This is how it's found in, in, in high resolution crystal structures. So it bones, it, it, there are several types of boats, skew boats, half chair envelopes conformation, but it's not a relaxed chair as, 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 it, as it will be for a sugar in, in solution, so a monosaccharide in solution. This is known from the 90s, from the end of the 90s, and it's now well established. It was early thought that already that uh, this had, was a functional feature essentially because the, this distortion places the living group in an axial orientation and that facilitates the nucleophilic attack. Um, we've been uh, interested in this problem for several years. And what we found in our first study in this field 12 years ago, when we started in, to, uh, doing application in glycobiology, working with 1314 beta glucanase, what we found is that indeed the distortion makes the, the reaction easy for this uh, glycosidase because it, it lowers the activation energy of the reaction because the distorted substrate assembles the transitional state of the reaction. In the transitional state, the substrate is quite distorted. It's an oxycarbonium ion. These four atoms are in a plane. And the conformation that one observes in the Michaelis complex is very similar to the one of the transitional state, not just structurally, but also electronically. There are charts being developed at the anomeric carbon compare, if you compare a distorted with an undistorted substrate. And that lengthens the uh, this, uh, as a consequence, the glycosidine one is, is longer and everything goes into the direction of facilitating uh, the reaction. And so the distorted substrate is kind of preactivated for catalysis. And that's what makes this distortion uh, interesting because by, by knowing the conformation of the substrate in the Michaelis complex, we can guess, we can know what will be the, this, the conformation at the transitional state, which is important to design inhibitors for a particular, for every particular glycosidase, because they are similar. So one knows this one, the, the distortion here, then you can guess what would be the distortion of the transition state. Mm. Now I should make, a, uh, I should give some, some technical considerations here how to, about how to, how we can study what will be the distortion of the sugar in the Michaelis complex. How we can describe it uh, with, with simulation, what kind of level of theory do, do we need? When we started in, the, in this field, we thought that, okay, this is not a problem of breaking or uh, forming covalent bonds. Uh, it's just a question of uh, torsions here. So we should be able to describe it with just classical molecular dynamics. This is what we started doing. But that turned out not to be, not to be, not to be so satisfactory for us. This is, for instance, one three one four beta glucanase. This is an enzyme that clips specifically, that clips uh, uh, hydrolyzes one three one four beta glucans that are uh, glucans found in certain cereals like barley, and the enzyme clips uh, specifically the one four bonds in linkages in a one three one four sequence. Like those linkages are, are are very specific. Um, this is a model of the Michaelis complex with the substrate in a skew ball configuration, in a skew ball conformation. I don't go into detail how we we'll obtain this structure, but let me just tell you that this is the expected distortion, the expected conformation, because it's the one that has been found in other glycosidases acting on similar substrates. So it would have been so very surprising to find that this was not the, the right uh, um, conformation or, or a similar, similar to this one, but not a very different one. However, when we did classical molecular dynamic simulations, what we found is that the, the, the sugar uh, undistorts. So it goes back to a, to a it goes back, it never was a chair, no, but it, it evolves to a chair conformation, to a to totally relaxed chair for C1. That was very surprising because it's not that it evolves to another type of distorted conformation, but it undistorts completely, it's a relaxed conformation. And this has not been observed in any glycosidase uh, before in, in, in crystal in high resolution crystal structures. So that would have been the first case of a beta glycos of an beta endoglycosidase with a non-distorted substrate. On the other hand, the uh, chair conformation is not is not good for catalysis because the, the living group is, is is oriented equatorially. That's not good for the nucleophilic attack. So um, so we decided to dig a bit more on this on this problem here. And then we, we observe that if we uh, if we um, raise the charge of the anomeric carbon, if we change the charge of the anomeric, we make it larger, we could stabilize a skew bolt conformation in the dynamics. But that's not good, of course. We cannot just play with the charge and have the result that we want. 
So we thought that this is a problem that maybe requires also PMMM. So we went to PMMM describing the, the substrate, uh, the part of the substrate with uh, quantum mechanics. And then we found that, the, in fact, that the skew ball conformation uh, was stable. I should say also uh, that in the molecular, in the classical MD, this uh, and distortion, I mean, of the substrate happened very quickly. Actually, in that case, happened just during the, the optimization. It's not even uh, with molecular dynamics. Uh, but in other cases, you can, uh, it happens at different, different times. So um, this is the result that we got with KMMMD. The distortion is stable in time for at least 10 picoseconds. We have now extended this to more and it's stable. And uh, the distortion, the conformation is a mixture of, is a mixture of skew vote, uh, this type of vote conformation. And uh, both conformations fulfill the condition that the living group is axial, so the both are okay for catalysis, they are actually very similar. And we verified later, some years later, that uh, they correspond to the glo global minimum of the conformational uh, fringe landscape of the substrate in the enzyme. So we are now quite sure about this, this distortion in 1314 beta glucanase. We have found this type of a scenario, in fact, in, in which we are not able to stabilize a distortion with classical MD, we found in other, in other cases. Sometimes we are not able to reproduce the crystal star, the, the experimental structure mm -hmm. with classical force fields. It doesn't happen all the time. You may be lucky, and maybe uh, force field in some cases it, it, uh, it reproduces the, the right conformation. But is risky, so you should take care and uh, check whether the with the force field is what the force field is doing is it makes chemical sense or not. And the reason why this happened, we think, is very simple. Um, the charge of the carbon, carbon, and also the uh, atoms in the ring change from one conformation to another. It is something that is not reproduced with classical MD. So it is normal that for some certain conformation, uh, force fields could, could not do a good job on it. So our tip here is check if conformation sample during the classical MD makes sense, and if not, uh, you play some tricks like you can just fix the six atoms of the ring uh, until you start QMMM molecular dynamics. Okay, um, so we've been using QMMM for for uh, for describing the conformation of the substrate in the active site of glycoside hydrolases. Um, here's some, some technical, uh, more, more technical detail. The code that we use is typically is the CPMD, is PMMM, the interface of the Rosis, Ursula Rotslisberger Rosis, Rosis, group. Sometimes we use also CP2K, but this is the one and we have more experience. And um, concerning the, the DFT functional that we use, we, we've been uh, using PBE for several reasons. First, because it describes quite well hydrogen bonds. And there's a lot of hydrogen bonds that uh, in that surround the, the sugar uh, with the hydroxyl of the sugar and, and the protein. And second, because it describes quite well the conformation of the sugar conformations of sugars. Um, there are several studies of it uh, in comparison with high-level uh, methods. This is, for instance, a recent study by Mariansky and co-workers in which they, this, they compare the performance of several uh, DFT functionals and also same empirical methods and force fields uh, with respect to couple cluster um, results. And they found that uh, DFT functionals perform quite well, the standard DFT functionals. Uh, same empiricals are not so good. And uh, here's the, the glycum, the specific force field for carbohydrate doesn't do a very good job for conformation. It does a very good job for other things like uh, dynamics in general of, of carbohydrate in enzymes. No? But if you want to look at specifically of the conformation of one sugar, this is uh, not enough. And the PBE tends to be the, the cheaper one of the, of, the, of the density functionals that still gives uh, quite a good accuracy. So we've been using this one. And um, uh, to finish with the technical considerations, I should also tell you how do we uh, classify sugar conformation because there are several types. We've seen this one, one is three, B to five. What does it mean, and how can we differentiate one from the other? Okay, on in mechanistic studies of glycosidases of uh, carbohydrate type enzymes in general, one normally uses the so called packering coordinates. Those are three coordinates, so a radius and two angles that describes uh, changing these conformations. You have all the uh, you can um, specify all the conformation of a six member ring. 
um, this co the, all the conformations appear on the sphere of, a, of, of a, on the surface of a sphere of radius q. On the poles, there is the two chair conformations, the normal chair and the inverted chair, one C4. So here, carbon number one is up above the plane, carbon number four is, is below, this is the opposite. On the equator, there are all the boats and skew boat conformations, by just, just, just changing the theta coordinate, uh, and, and, and the, um, the theta and the phi. And on the tropics that are not drawn here, there will be the half chair and envelope conformations. So, Knowing the Cartesian coordinates of the six atoms of the ring, one can, by solving this uh, simple linear set of equations, one can know the packaging coordinates, the Q, Z, and phi. So you can put a point in this sphere and know what is what which exact conformation you have, whether it is a, a canonical conformation like B3O or it is in between two conformations or between three conformations. But of course, this is a three-dimensional um, object that is uh, very uh, not so easy to to, to interpret, so one normally uses uh, projections either from the from the North Pole or from the South South Pole. This is a so-called Stoddard diagram. Also, you can use a rectangular projection. So this is not very different from from what we do uh, people doing in in cartography, you know, using this type type of projections. This type of diagrams are quite useful in in mechanistic studies to delineate what is the conformational itinerary that the substrate follows during the reaction, during catalysis. For instance, uh, family two and family 26 uh, glycoside hydrolases, which are beta monosidases, they usually follow this itinerary. That means the Michaelis complex has been trapped crystallographically and it is in one S5 conformation. Then we know that the product complex is always two, so one can guess that the transitional state will be to five because this is, this is on, the, on, the, on the pathway. And other families of glycosidases use different, different pathways, for instance, uh, family 20, that which are beta glucosidases, use this other itinerary. And there are also glycoside hydrolases that use itinerates in the southern hemisphere, uh, not so many, but uh, family 29 is one of them. And you can draw these these itineraries here in the in the stellar diagram, the circular diagram, and also in the in the rectangular diagram. The itinerary normally is is, uh, is common for all the enzymes or even family because they have the same sequence, similar sequence, so similar active site, also similar active site structure. The itinerary is, is usually also similar for, for glycosidases that even if they are from different families, they act on similar substrates like beta monosidases follow this itinerary, or beta glucosidases follow this other one. But there are several glycosidases for which the itinerary is not known or it is controversial. I mean, you have uh, contributed to solve some of these, to clarify some of these itineraries for several glycosidases. And I will focus today in one, in one example uh, which is a uh, family 134 beta mananase. This is a, a glycosidase uh, that acts on, on beta manan. Beta manan is a, is a plant polysaccharide. It's a linear polymer of beta manose. So this is beta manose units. Beta manose is, sim is, is very similar to beta glucose, but uh, the hydroxyl at position two is equatorial, is, sorry, is axial instead of being equatorial like the other ones. If that was equatorial, that would be glucose. And then instead of beta manan, that would be, could be, for instance, cellulose. But so just the uh, change of um, orientation of one OH changes the chemistry completely in, in carbohydrates. Um, beta manan has many applications in, in industry, in the paper industry and in biofuel, and you can also use it as, as prebiotic. You can take it for your, uh, for your microbiota. Mm. Some years ago, uh, a new, uh, sorry, no, I should say that what is the typical itinerary of beta uh, manosidases? As I, I, I already mentioned it before, no? beta manosidases typically use this itinerary on the equator of the Klemmer and Popel sphere, and they go through a B25 transitional state. This is what is known from several uh, beta manosidases that had been already characterized. Why do they follow this itinerary? Well, because in the Michaelis complex 1S5, the glycosidic bond is, is axial, that's good for nucleophilic attack, and there's no aesthetic interaction between the nucleophile and the 2OH, which is normally, this is a problem in beta-manocyte catalysis. 
the same happens here in the beta 5 transition state. So that's the, the usual conformation, uh, conformational itinerary for beta monosidases. So let's say to design inhibitor for a beta monosidase, one normally targets a b 5 conformation. Mm. The itinerary is also similar for alpha manosidases, but they go in the opposite direction. This is uh, just, just to remember you, this is a beta mano, beta manos with beta uh, with beta uh, stereochemistry and domestic carbon, that would be alpha manos. Alpha manosidases follow this uh, the itinerary on the opposite direction, but they also follow a B25. They also use a B25 transition state. A typical example is um, Golgi alpha manosidase 2. This is a, an enzyme involved in protein glycosylation. And it is a therapeutic target because it's overexpressed in, in several types of cancers. So it's important to find inhibitor, to develop inhibitors for this enzyme that do not inhibit other glycosidases. And it's, uh, it's called Golgi because it is it's placed, it's, it's, it, 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 um, it is located in the, in the Golgi complex in the cell. Some years ago, uh, we, we, we uncovered the the mechanism of this uh, of action of this enzyme, and we found that in the Michaelis complex, the sugar uh, adopts a twisted bond conformation OS2, like typical. That well, it was not that typical at that time. That was a starting to be, to be. It was a quite controversial, uh, in fact. But now it is uh, more established. And we found that it was a, a, the the B25 co uh, transitional state co uh, conformation in the in the transitional state, and that contributed a little more to clarify. That this type of bot conformation can be can can be used by by for monocyte uh, hydrolysis at that time. Um, so uh, some years ago, a new family of, of monosidases, mananase, in fact, that the um, enzyme that hydrolyzes beta manan was discovered, and uh, the protein in that case enzyme. The authors find that they have no homology to any proteins with known functions, so they Propose that they, they, they should be a new family. They belong, this mananase belongs to a new family of glycosidases. There were 133 families at that time. So uh, that was 2015. So from this time, then there's one more, 134. And very soon later, a first crystal structure appeared from our uh, colleagues in the University of York. This is the structure of the GH 134 beta mananase with a beta manan fragment spanning in the, in the active site and with a very, very good uh, resolution. And when they analyzed the structure, they found several uh, unusual, uh, unusual aspects. The first aspect is that the, the overall fold is not the typical of other beta manosidases, but it resembles very much li lysozyme. Isozyme is also a glycoside hydrolysis. It's a classical glycoside hydrolysis. It was the first enzyme ever crystallized. And, but lysozyme is another family of a quite different family of uh, glycosidase. And it doesn't hydrolyze beta manan. It acts on different substrates. So it, we have the same fold, similarly similar fold for a different function. The new enzyme, beta manan, the new beta mananase, is an inverter. It, it catalyzes the glycosidic bond with inversion of configuration. That means there should be a water molecule between the general base and the catalytic and the numeric carbon. And this is, uh, this is what is found in the crystal structure, because there is a water molecule well defined here between the uh, reactive sugar and the catalytic base. So, that, that is fine. But the most, uh, the most surprising or the most unusual aspect in the structure was that the reactive sugar, this one here, the so-called minus one subside of the enzyme, it doesn't adopt the, uh, the typical distortion of beta manosidases. This is a 1C4 conformation. It's an inverted chair. The other ones is, are follow the, the, the Adopt the typical 4C1, they should not be distorted. But the reactive sugar, the one that one expects to be distorted, but one didn't expect to, be, to, 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 to find a distortion that is so different from other beta manosidases. This looks like an outlier. So um, that points to, a, to an itinerary in the southern hemisphere, because if you start from the South Pole, from 1C4, you cannot reach uh, a transitional, you cannot go through a transitional state in the, in the in the equator as the typical transition state for other manosidases. So this is incompatible with the typical itinerary of manosidases. So what happens here is this uh, novel itinerary that was this, that uh, uh, for this novel uh, glycosidase, or it is maybe an improbable, um, 
and productive complex, who knows. So we decided to go uh, to do UKMMM simulations for this enzyme to find it out. Mm, this is the typical um, methods that, that you use that I already described before, which is the density function of theory, the PV in the chem region, which is summer and glycam for the MM atoms. Because part of the polysaccharide will be in the in the MM region, we also need a force field for it. And we use a initial molecular dynamics to take into account the temperature effects and move all the all the atoms at room temperature. To activate the chemical reaction, where the chemical reaction will not happen in a normal PMM molecular dynamics because you need to overcome a barrier and it has this is a red event, it happens in a, in a time scale that is not accessible by initial D. So we use an ancel sampling me method, in particular we use metadynamics to activate the chemical reaction. This is the typical protocol that, that we use. So uh, it's not very different from any pro any MMM protocol. We start from the PDB structure. Uh, in that case, uh, given to us by from our collaborators, we prepare the system. That it's an important step that uh, we need to take uh, to be careful here because the um, the crystal structure can come with. Uh, many little errors or atoms that do not correspond to the density, um, residues that do not know how to protonate, uh, missing residues, etc., etc. So this is an important step. Uh, then we equilibrate the, the minimize, of course, and then equilibrate uh, the, the system. This is also an important step because in uh, carbohydrates are very floppy. Um, it would, it, it sometimes not, it's, it's sometimes not surprising that the, the, the substrate escapes the active site during the during the, the equilibration. So it, it thinks to need to be done a bit, maybe sometimes a bit more carefully than the standard a standard a standard systems due, due, due to that the fact that not only the enzyme is, is very dynamic, but also the 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 the, the sure the, the carbohydrate is very dynamic. Um, then you of course you choose a so which atoms you will you will you will be treated. Uh, you will treat by quantum mechanics, and which atoms you will be treated by molecular mechanics. You so you choose the chem region. You recalibrate it because now the quantum atoms, the, the QM, QM, QM atoms, are now subjected to the electron density, subjected to the DFT potential, and before they were subjected to the force field. So there is a shock here, and you need to recalibrate you now to avoid uh, artifacts when you start later the the reaction simulation. Then once you recalibrate the system, you choose collective variables. So you, you, you use your chemical intuition. You think what, what is likely to be the reaction coordinate, and you choose some collective variables that correspond to this reaction coordinate, and you do the reaction simulation. In our case, we use metadynamics, but you can use here any, any non-sampling method, and you can also do even, even a static uh, simulations, of course. And then you guess that you you try to try to interpret what will be the reaction mechanism. Um, so uh, so maybe I should stress here that this part, in, in particular for carbohydrate active enzymes, is very important. It's very important because um, it's, it doesn't make sense to to do all this part that is going to be very um, computationally demanding if you don't do well the thermal equilibration. So check well the system, check well that uh, that uh, it, everything makes sense, that, that there is no, apart from the catalytic residues, check the sequential residues, the whole protein, check RMSD for different parts, that, that everything makes sense, because otherwise you, would, you don't want to have a small error here that then is translated into uh, months of simulation here for, for nothing, okay? So, Okay, there's also a shortcut that some people use, but I don't recommend, that is using directly the crystal structure. I don't, I don't recommend because the crystal structure is, a, is an average structure. It doesn't correspond to any to, uh, to any point in any in, in instant or in the lifetime of this uh, biomolecule. It's an average structure and you, it can it can uh, lead to many errors if you if you start directly the reaction simulations from, from the crystal structure, even, even if, you, if you minimize. Okay, so going back to our enzyme, to the GH, to the beta manosidase. So this is the classical simulation. The first thing that we did was to revert the mutation that was here to in the in the crystal structure. They mutated the acid base residue to 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 be able to to obtain a Michaelis complex. So we revert it to the to the real glutamic acid residue. This is a an quite innocent mutation that normally doesn't change the conformation of the reactive sugar. We have checked this in other, in other enzymes. That would not be the case if you uh, mutate the 
the nuclear file or the, the general base, but the, the acid base residue doesn't normally change the, any, doesn't affect the conformation. Then uh, we paid special attention at the position of disputative water, because water are very mobile. Uh, we checked that uh, during the classical simulation, what was specific, what was checked especially the dynamics of this water, and it, it stays uh, all the time uh, wandering around, but uh, fluctuating around, around this position, just in, in place for catalysis. Sometimes it gets swapped by another one, so that sometimes it leaves the active set, and but immediately another water molecule enters. So there's not always the same water, but al there's always a water molecule here, well oriented for catalysis. Okay, then we decide what will be the quantum part, the quantum, uh, the quantum region. This is uh, uh, with some more details of the simulation, but I, I already commented this before. So this is our quantum region. This is the substrate, the manopentyl, so five, five uh, sugar rings, five uh, beta manose rings. We, this is the bond to be cleaved by the enzyme. This is the anomeric carbon, the important carbon. Mm, we normally take one ring before and one after the, 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 the reactive bond uh, as in the quantum region. So we, we cut it here, and this is MM. Here, we decided not to cut here, because not, not just to leave uh, half a sugar uh, isolated there and in the MM region, and just to avoid using too many, too many link atoms, also because we are using we are using a plain going basis set, and the number of atoms is not uh, so much an issue as long as the, the box uh, enclosed in the atoms remains quite the same. We are, uh, we are of course, including the catalytic residues because there will be bonds to be formed and cleaved involving these residues. Normally, we cut them at the C alpha carbon, and of course, we include the catalytic water. That, that makes a total of 98 FIAM atoms. Uh, then, this is the QMMM equilibration of the enzyme. Uh, moves at room temperature. Uh, the sugar doesn't change uh, conformation in this in this process. And the next step is the reactive, the react, react, reactant simulation, the reaction simulation. Uh, we use metadynamics with three collective variables that include all the covalent bonds that are broken, that we think we know are going to be broken or formed during the catalytic reaction. One collective variable uh, accounts for the nucleophilic attack and the departure of the living group. It, it will be the difference between these two distances that are uh, quite a, a couple, these two distances. The other collective variable, CB2, will account for the deprotonation of the water. It will be the difference between these two distances. And the third collective variable is the protonation of the living group. So uh, we split this uh, collection of distances into three, three variables. And here is more, a bit more detail of the distances that, that we use for the as collective variables. We always try to use the, all the covalent bonds that are expected to be formed or broken during the reaction, but sometimes that makes uh, too high, uh, uh, that makes too, too many collective variables. And so then we check, but if, if that's the case, we, you can check by unidimensional metadynamics to discern the most important bonds contributing to the reaction coordinate, because no, not all of them weight the same in the reaction coordinate. Here, for instance, the most important one is the, uh, um, the nucleophilic attack by the water and the, the, and the departure of the, of the living group. And um, when we do the metadynamic simulation, this is some, some details of the, um, this is maybe just for uh, metadynamics uh, experts here. Um, this is the metadynamic simulation, and this is the reactive sugar, the one that uh, before the bond to be cleaved by the enzyme. This is a trajectory of the metadynamics, and I just want you to see how this sugar, the reactive sugar, changes conformation and it advances uh, towards the here to, towards the, the catalytic base uh, because we cannot ex uh, we cannot um, appreciate much detail here. But from the from the simulation, we obtain a free energy landscape. Uh, it should be in three dimensions, but this is a projection into one of the collective variables, so which is easy to analyze. And we can we can take a snapshots along the minimum energy pathway, and we can see that the in the reactants, well, the sugar is in a one C four conformation. But as as soon as the water starts attacking the anomeric carbon and the glycosidic bond starts to be cleaved. It changes to a, 
to a half chair conformation, so a 3H4 conformation, which is in the southern hemisphere. The energy barrier that we get for the reaction is 17 kilocalories per mole. That's uh, acceptable and is quite similar to the one of the uh, extracted, uh, estimated from experiment that was about 15 kilocalories per mole for, for this system, but it was not the same for similar substrates, I should not be also exactly the same. And then the sugar evolves in the product complex, so when the glycosidic bond is completely broken and the water has already delivered a proton to the general base, so we have here the, the, the sugar with the, with the inversion of configuration. We got here a beta, beta, um, a beta glycosidic bond, and here we have an alpha hydroxyl. Then we obtain a 3H1 configuration. So we confirm that this is the, an itinerary in the south, southern hemisphere. We can analyze much more the free energy landscape to obtain more detail. Okay, this is free energy. So for every point along the minimum free energy pathway, we don't have just one structure. We have a collection of a structure that that uh, all of them have the same collective variables, but they differ in all in all, all, all other in many other degrees of freedom. So every every at every point, for instance, the reactant, if we want to see the, how long, length is the long is the glycosidic bond, we have a value an average value with certain standard deviation corresponding to all this collection of structures. And we can see here, for instance, that the, uh, the transition state, we can analyze all the structures that correspond to the transition state, and we can see that it's quite a dissociative transition state because the glycosidic bond is broken, uh, practically broken at the transition state, and the, what, the water is starting to attack. We can also see that the nucleophilic water is not yet deprotonated. That happens later in the, the reaction pathway. And the living group, the living group uh, is already protonated because uh, this, uh, this the cleavage of this glycosidic bond needs real, really assistance by the acid base, base ratio. Um, then we also found that there was a surprise at the reaction products. If we, we you see the, the free energy landscape, you can see there are two minima in the products region. They are separated by the by um, the CB2, which is the water proton transfer. Now something happens in this in this region here. What is the difference? This is P. This is the first minimum product in which the sugar is in 3s1 and then what happened from here to here is uh, uh, is something that this doesn't take a lot of energy because this is a uh, two or three kilocalories per mole energy barrier um, what happened is that a water molecule enters the active site a water molecule that a classical water actually because we that was not part of the Korean region, but doesn't matter. We there is this water molecules that can come and classical that come in and out during the PMMM simulation, and it sits in between the sugar and the general base resin. So that's the that's the other minimum that uh, that we obtain in the product region. And by doing when that happens, the sugar changes to one C four. So it's again a conformation in the south pole. But um, this is very in quite a good agreement with uh, experiments because in the structure of the product complex that was also obtained by our colleagues, what they see is that the sugar actually is in 1C4 and there is a water well defined between the sugar and the, the general base resin. So that, that was in a very good, good um very good uh, agreement and there's two ways to obtain this this other product either you you analyze the sorry I'll go back a bit either you analyze here the fringe landscape but if you take a snapshot from p and you do mmm md without any metadynamics you also reach we were also reaching this other this other configuration because the energy barrier was was very slow so so with the mmm md and metadynamics we were able so we were able to connect the two structures that had been detected, that, that had been obtained experimentally, the Michaelis and the product complex. We can hear the complete pathway, and we confirm that this is an itinerary in the southern hemisphere, so a novel itinerary for beta for beta like uh, beta monoxidases. So up to now, all of them follow an itinerary with a B25 uh, transition state, but G8 family 134 is a beta monoxidase that uses a 3H4 transition state. So that's the one to be um, to target for uh, to, to the develop inhibitors for, for, for this type of monosidase. So there are two distinct solutions to facilitate the nucleophilic attack on a manos residue. And 
Okay, so we confirm this solemn itinerary. This is the picture that my PhD student did. And um, webinars are very strange because normally when I when I put this picture, people start laughing, but now I don't even know if people is laughing or, or you think, oh, that's a stupid, but anyway, that's a problem of webinars. And um, this is an international collaboration. Uh, it involves uh, groups in the northern northern hemisphere and also in the southern hemisphere, our collaborators in, in Australia, which were very happy actually because uh, because for once the southern hemisphere wins the race. And uh, if you want to know more on catalytic mechanisms of manosidases, you can see I don't know there is a new we, we wrote a new um, a viewpoint uh, this year about uh, several mechanism of manosidases, including a new endomanosidase that forms that this is, this is very much and much more unusual than the one I described because this one goes through through an epoxide intermediate. And uh, this is all for today. Uh, I should apologize because in my abstract I wrote that I was going to talk about another enzyme, but later I realized there was no time if I want to describe things in a bit more detail. So um, I would like to thank the people of my group. This is the last picture that we did uh, pre-pandemic. And the calculations that I, that I described were done uh, by Chevy Viernes. Uh, he was working on 1314 beta glucanase, finding all these problems with a distortion and not distortion. And Luis Reich, a previous PhD student also, that he did all the work on GH134, so on the beta manosidase that goes through the southern itinerary. And I also thank my experimental collaborators and the agencies that provide us funding. So uh, thanks for your attention. I'm going to uh, switch now to the webinar, maybe, and uh, open the... I'm ready for questions now. OK, thank you very much, Carmen. That was very, very nice. Um, I think people probably appreciate, I mean, uh, the insight, even if they're interested in, in the additional enzyme you mentioned, I think uh, the detail you provided in the simulation protocol, I think, was very valuable, especially for people who are starting out to see uh, some of the key steps and not to take the shortcuts that you <laughs> um, warned people not to take uh, but using the crystal structure directly. So that was uh, very interesting. Um, I certainly have one or two questions I can ask. Um, I don't know if my colleagues, uh, Gert or Emiliano, would like to ask something. Uh, I'm Emiliano. Mm. Can you hear me? Yes, hi. Um, I have a question in general because um, mm. I've seen that uh, when uh, you you are able to get transition states uh, uh, states and uh, transition states and uh, Michaelis complex from QMM, uh, then uh, many people exploit this information to uh, to uh, find the best in, uh, inhibitor for uh, some uh, some reaction. And I'm wondering uh, what is the um, the additional value to know the transition state with respect to try to uh, the strategy to get inhibitors simply uh, occupying the uh, the binding state uh, in the binding site uh, yeah. in uh, mm -hmm. in, uh, in some yeah. other way. Yeah. What is mm -hmm. the additional value to to, to, know, to know to get this yeah. information? Yeah, uh, um, from my experience in glycosidases, is you should do both. So you should target not only the conformation but also also try to feel the uh, positive subsides and the negative so to ma to make a good uh, inhibitor that binds uh, better in the in the active so you, you you don't need to target only this conformation there is a combination of things normally one targets the conformation the char the charge because you need to put a positive charge in a, an atom that is the analog of the anomaly carbon in your inhibitor and also some some living group that uh, that fits in the in the active site, but you should not forget any any of the three. So it's a combination of the three, and you can even target not just the conformation of the transition state. Sometimes you you try to make an inhibitor of transition state, but what what turns out is an is a a Michaelis complex uh, analog or a product analog. So um, I, th I think I would say the rule is to 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 target any of the conformation along the reaction pathway. Mm. I see. Yeah. Thank you. And of course, try to make it different from, uh, try to see what, what, so if you want to inhibit an enzyme, but do not want to inhibit another one, you should look at the differences in the catalytic pathways, different itineraries. 
-hmm. and try to find a, a one of the conformations that is good for one but not for the other and then uh, make an inhibitor that is locked in this conformation mm -hmm. okay uh, I see that we have some question already hello Kami how are you hello, hello Adrian it's a nice talk, thank you. Uh, my my question was, you, you mentioned some of the crystallographic evidence for distortion, and as as you as you've said, you know some some of those structures, particularly the older structures, um, yeah, they may they may not be correct because of the models that yeah. we use and so yeah. on. So I was yeah. just wondering yeah. if you've gone back and and looked at those structures because your simulations might you know, correct them and and actually identify the the nature of the distortion yeah 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 that's that's possible well i have not we haven't not gone to uh, back so early structures with uh, not good resolution and so on uh but well we have some and then I some mean, of the it, yeah there is the a structure one. one of the Sorry. first that that it was it was um, predicted that it was uh, uh, conform a certain distortion and we checked by QMMM and we had the same distortion actually even though the resolution was not good so uh, and in one case and um, sometimes what, what we found is that um, uh, do you, I don't know the exact the precise question is in some quest in some cases we found a different conformation from the crystal structure and we can correct the crystal structure yes you mean so yes. why so once you get the crystal structure how do you know the the, the 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 one you get is not correct because it is not it doesn't make chemical sense it is the only way to know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but but that this is what happened in the example that i gave crystallographically uh it, it, it got chemical sense only if, if you are talking about the novel itinerary otherwise they could think maybe it's an artifact there's a mutation there maybe the crystal conditions i don't know there are several several factors that that can play a role there so yes. this is what we check that's the the, com the combination of the stra of the experiment and the calculation tells you that this is a novel itinerary it's not it's not it's not anything anything strange but uh, i can tell you sometimes in in one case uh what what um what we've been checking particularly is that uh, to obtain these michaelis complexes one needs to perturb the structure somewhere to be able to trap the the structure of the substrate with enzyme otherwise it reacts and you don't see any Michaelis complex you don't see any substrate you know? so one way is to do a uh, very gentle mutation like the one they, they did in this study just the acid base and they were lucky they could trap but sometimes that doesn't work uh, experimentally who knows why and then they they do more perturbation so they put a fluor in the way to uh, in the two position also not to see whether this doesn't react and then if not they mutate also this one at the end you don't know if the, the distortion that we find you find is a consequence of all these mutations or not and uh We've been looking at some of these cases. Uh, I remember one in which um, the structure was that was um, had been determined with a with a substrate in which the glycosidine agent was substituted by sulfur, so it's a thio derivative, and it was a very strange distortion. Well, it was it was not distorted at all that one. It has it was once four C one, and we were very surprised. So we did the the, the, the study. Not only the PMMMD, we also computed the the Friannes landscape of that sugar in the enzyme to see whether there is other uh, minima that corresponds to the to, uh, room temperature. The sugar could have several conformations, and the global minimum was not the first one in the crystal of the thio derivative. And we did the, the we did the natural substrate with the OHS. So first we did the thio derivative, and we checked that it was for C1. But when we change the sulfur by oxygen, then it was I don't remember uh, 2SO or OS2, another one that was that had more chemical sense according to the function of this enzyme. And then the, we tell the crystallographers, and the crystallographers did uh, well another group, and in fact a group of Vivian Davis, they did the structure without a thio derivative. They used their natural substrate. They use another type of mutation of the acid base residue to trap it, and then they got the one that we predicted. So, uh, if, if the question is if uh, the methodology can can uh, correct crystal structures, uh, in some cases, I guess so. But uh, if you do all this, all this, all this work, yeah, yeah, Thank but you. it's not something that you just press the button and you get the crystal structure. Oh, correct. No, no, you you need to spend some some weeks there uh, studying and. 
Something sure. Like yeah. The, the the basic point I think is that as you know, good crystallographers like Gideon know, um, the simulations may in some cases actually help to to sort out the crystal structure to help you identify the real structure. So the QMMM may be better than the the crystallographic refinement, and I can say that because I'm speaking yeah, to a computer. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah, but it's also tricky to to set up the system for QMMM because you if you yeah. come for a for a crystal structure is not so good. Be careful that your results are not uh, due to the to this uh, uh, answer that you get. Of course, it's always better to start with a good res resolution crystal structure. Yeah. Okay, we have some other questions that have come in. I think you might be able to see the next question, yes, Carmen. Yes, I see. Uh, for instance, hi, uh, nice talk. I wanted to know how long was the sampling in metadynamics? I think you saying a lower level of theory like DFT type binding will be helpful. So, um, how long was the sampling? Uh, in the example that I show, I don't remember, maybe 30 picoseconds or something to have the complete reaction. But uh, that depends from the system to system and from how deep are the minimums, how many minimums you need to fill, etc. That depends on the free energy landscape. And if you're in a lower level of theory, we haven't tried, but uh, since in that particular case, I'm talking about glycosidases, and as you know, there is this problem of distortion, of conformation, and so on. And some empiricals, they don't seem to be get a very good job on this. So you probably can do it, but just be careful and check things and so on. I think uh, in the interest question. of time, yeah, we have a few more questions. So whereas I would normally unmute each, each, oh, yeah. each person, I, I will say we can go on yes, with the yes. next question now. Yeah, which one? This one, how much resources does this metadynamics in QMMM take? So the example that I show, I think we were running for three weeks, the metadynamics, using uh, probably 64 processors, not running all the time, but uh, something like this. Hmm. What would be the maximum number of atoms manageable in metadynamics? Yeah, no, I, I sorry, I am lost. What, what is this? Uh, Oh, you know, sorry, it's, it's maximum atoms in both QMMM and MMM atoms come for free. I mean, the bottleneck is the QM, so you can make it as, much, as big as, as you want the MMM. You can treat one subunit, two subunits of the protein. The, the QM is the bottleneck. How many atoms? Uh, that depends on your machine. No? If you have a, a supercomputer with millions of hours and uh, many processors, you can probably manage, I don't know, 500 atoms in the QM region and have a MD step of uh, just 10 seconds. But if you have a lower, uh, not a, a standard resources <laughs> like us, maybe, I don't know, up to 150 is, is fine. Mm -hmm. But that depends how, how long can you wait. You want to wait for this project. If you have more atoms, I mean, you can put as much as you want, just that it will be slower. And instead of one year uh, project, it will be two years project. So it's, uh, but uh, as I said, for this, uh, for this case that I was about 100, we were three weeks, the metadynamic simulation. That's not three weeks project because before the metadynamics, there's a QMM equilibration. And before that, there was a uh, classical simulation and so on and preparation of the system. And there is also, one can make mistakes in this process, no? And go back and forth and so on. And that depends on your skills and the student skills and there are many, many variables here. So the whole pro project may take easily six months for 100 QM atoms in, in a reasonable, uh, in using reasonable amount of resources. Another question, let's go to another question. Uh, Kikarma, uh, I, just will talk. I just wonder, how do you select the collective variables to follow during the QMMM simulation? Would be any change in the profile if you follow also the hydral, the hydral planes? Ah, on the sugar carbons instead of following, no. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Some people can think that since the sugar changes conformation, maybe if I if I activate this change of conformation, I get the chemical reaction. But that's not the case. Hmm? Mm, that's not part of the reaction coordinate. 
uh, I mean, it's not a, a low energy mode that needs to be activated within the dynamics. That the the the, the conformational changes automatically as long as as the glycosidic bond breaks. And we know this, for instance, because if we do if we compute a free energy landscape of the conformation of the substrate in the enzyme, this is something I have not uh, uh, not discussed about it, but. You can see that the energetic cost of uh, changing conformation in the active site of the enzyme, uh, and maybe you find a conformation that is the global minimum, another one that is more, is less stable. But but uh, if you go from one to the other, the, the glycosidic bond does not break, so the reaction does not occur. So that's not any, that's not what is considered a, a, a low frequency mode in the in the metadynamic. It's not a, a mode of the system that you need to worry to activate in a metadynamic simulation. What you need to activate is the breakage of the and the covalent bonds that are going to break or form during the reaction. That's the main, the minimum, uh, the minimum factors that you need to to consider. So they, they will not uh, do this. Question sounds a little bit more involved. So I think for this one. I will ask Juliana if she wants to uh, uh, follow up and say whether that makes sense or not. So, Juliana, I will just try to unmute you. Hi, Carmen. I know if you hear me. Yes. Yes. Well, no, I just. Uh, I just wonder. I know if if you will have like any change because you show us that you follow. I know just bone breaking and and just just the bone length. And I just answer. I wonder, sorry, if if you also include the the changes in the orientation of the, I know the dihedral planes of the carbon related to the the hydroxyl group that you will attack, that it will be any change in the in the profile it, because you you show us that there is different conformations that when you start with one uh, conformation with the reactant then it changes from the uh, transition state and then you will have another change from the product. I just just wonder if you will have maybe uh, small barriers or maybe uh, different landscapes if you uh, consider more variables than uh, than just more the the, the bound lengths. That's yeah. No, I I don't I don't think so. Um, in I um, I think those are the main variables that the bond length because it's what it 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 takes it needs more energy for for the reaction to happen. But never, we never know. Of course, we haven't tried any more variables. Mm -hmm. But the fact the fact that the the energy um, barrier is reasonable is according to experiments mm -hmm. and comparing to other enzymes that we have investigated in which if we miss a variable immediately the, the energy barrier goes up. Mm -hmm. We can infer by comparison and by experience that we have uh, selected uh, the reasonable number of collective variables. Also because the product in the product region, it matches with the experimental mm -hmm. conformation and with experimental structure. So from all this, we can, uh, I would, I, I suspect uh, that the, that adding more variables will not change the results. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Carmen. And um, thanks for your talk. <laughs> Rodrigo, uh, are positions, but I don't see the complete question, are positions or distant restraints needed in some cases in the simulation, in the simulat, simulation? I don't know what comes uh, after, but I, I guess it's about, no, we didn't use any restraint. Ah, in some cases, and we tried to, normally not, uh, because if you need a restraint, uh, Let's put a extreme case. Maybe the sugar, maybe the carbohydrate escapes during the classical MD, the active site, and depending on what you do. So you are not reproducing the Michaelis complex. Then you can go on adding a restraint so that it, it is in in. We haven't done this. I mean, I, I mean, we haven't published something like this, but imagine you want to do this and then you you you, you oblige it to be in. But then how, how can you be sure that the result that you obtain is not a uh, influenced by this decision or sometimes just the project cannot be done if we have like, something like this we just stop the project and or we study more because maybe we are forgetting something maybe we didn't protonate correctly an histidine that is in the second shell and and uh, we don't apparently it doesn't look a problem but but it makes us uh, some interactions that you are not producing and so if that happens you just need to to, to work more until uh, to work harder until uh, it is every, everything is stabilized uh, without restraints. Mm -hmm. 
because then is the only way to make sure that what we do, the results that we obtain later with PMMM are realistic. There's always a risk of your result, no? but uh, try to avoid, uh, I would say this is my advice, try to avoid restraints. Try to avoid means uh, work harder to, to see what, how to, what is the reason that you need to add this restraint. It's very easy just to, to add restraints and go on. But, mm -hmm. Okay, I think in the interest of time, given the time we have available, I think we will uh, leave the questions there. Um, before we uh, end the session completely, I would, well, first of all, let me say again, thank you very much, Karma, for a very interesting talk. I thought it was very, very uh, valuable for people to, to, to see, especially the simulation protocol, even if they're not necessarily working with similar kinds of, uh, of, of systems as you described. Um, I just wanted to highlight um, the, before we finish the session, that um, we have, so this was the final webinar that was part of the workshop, but it is not the end of the workshop because we have a, um, a panel discussion coming up at the end of the month. So on Friday, January 29th, we'll have a session in the afternoon. Uh, details will be announced on the BioXL website, on the BioXL Twitter, and we will also be in touch by email with all the people who registered for the workshop webinars uh, with more information um, and, and registration information. So the idea with that session is that we really uh, look back at the emerging th uh, topics and themes that have, co that have come out of the of all of these webinars by the speakers in the workshop and evaluating some of the challenges that uh, people are face in doing QMM simulation. Uh, so if you have any questions for Karma or for any of the other speakers, I would like to encourage you uh, to attend uh, to attend that session. Um, so with that, uh, I would like to thank Karma again very much on behalf of BioXL and all of today's attendees. Um, and I wish you a good afternoon, everybody. <laughs>